Well, thank y'all for coming. Ever since growing up right here in Brooklyn, I started very young in civil rights with a group called Operation Breadbasket, which grew out of Martin Luther King's organization. But the focus of Breadbasket was economics. And at that time, we had the same debate that we still have. And that is, is the key to success for blacks, entrepreneurship or ownership, or is it going up the corporate ladder? I remember as a kid, John Johnson and Earl Graves, who you work with, they had a group called BOCA, Black Owned Communication Association. Uh, now, this year, I went along with others to John Johnson's funeral, and Graves is about the only one still owning some. Everybody else has sold to major corporations. So it's been a paradigm shift, and as they've gotten older, their tactics have changed. So I wanted to talk about that. What is the key to black success? Is it ownership? Or is it now just going up the corporate ladder? Alfred, you're the uh, man at Black Enterprise, <laughs> and Black Enterprise is the Bible of black business. What is your perspective on this? Well, if you read Black Enterprise, and I know you do, you notice that we cover both things. We cover entrepreneurial success and business ownership, and we cover corporate success. You need to have African Americans in particular placed in positions of influence in both arenas. One of the largest customers of small businesses, and black owned businesses in particular, is corporate America. It helps to have some highly placed African Americans within the corporate organization championing the idea that that corporation should do some of their contracting with black owned businesses. Patrice, you own the Harlem Tea Room. You're an entrepreneur. What do you, what do you think about this? I come from a corporate background. I worked for a very large financial service organization and I was doing very well at the company. But I just had a personal calling that I wanted to do something for myself. I think had I stayed at that company, I could have moved up the corporate ladder. So I really think it depends on the person and really what you want, what you're looking to do. Right. I agree with Patrice. It really depends on what that person desires. Because if you're, say, for example, running your own business, but you just never felt comfortable with the lack of security, you might fail. Because you're constantly worried about being secure rather than growing the business. I'm an attorney, so I come from the law firm environment which can be very structured and very rigid. I decided to branch out and start a sports-based website based on my sports and entertainment experience as a lawyer. One of the questions that I have, what is black media? Is it black-owned media? Or once a black media entity is bought, is it still black media? It's to each his own, but what's better for the community? Are both better for the community? Both are better for the community. Both of the examples we see here are people who got a lot of preparation, major law firm, corporate America, and use that training to become more successful entrepreneurs. The biggest thing that holds back black entrepreneurs in particular is not a lack of capital, it's a lack of preparation. And what this generation of black entrepreneurs has that their parents and grandparents didn't have was access to Wall Street, access to major law firms, access to corporate America where they could really learn the best then practices why don't in we have, businesses. Then why don't we have the same strong black businesses that our parents and grandparents had? I would submit that we have much bigger and stronger black businesses. And I would suggest even your company and your company, you don't care who walks through the door. Our parents' businesses were relegated to 12% of the market. Now we have a generation of, of business owners who can serve not only markets all across the country, but all around the world. And that only bodes well for black-owned business growth. But the reason I say that is if I look at the music industry, when I was a kid, we had Barry Gordy who owned the Motown. We had uh, Al Bell, Stax Records. Dick Griffey, Solar Record. Now the biggest names in black entertainment, none of them own the companies. Well, that's the conglomeratization of a particular industry. Today, you wouldn't start out if you were an up-and-coming entrepreneur in the record industry because that is now a mature, conglomeratized industry. But blacks are still the dominant talent, and we own less of it now. One of the things that we've been fooled with, as African Americans in particular, we're looking at the people on the court, on the field, on the stage, and thinks, oh, that's where the money is, and that's where the ownership is. You show me somebody that can write a $3 million a year contract for a basketball player, I'd rather be the guy that can write that check rather than uh, exactly. the guy that can cash that check. Right. And exactly. that's where we have to start getting well, no, but, but, but that's my point. My right. point is that's where we need to put focus. And we had 20, 30 years ago in the music industry. Now everybody's looking for a deal with the conglomerates. Right. right. The key thing is going to be do you stick to the identity of what you started with? Has the conglomerate changed the entire stream exactly. of, what that, you know, of what that business has now? And the person who's being acquired has to make sure that they're still branded with their identity. Well, how do they do that? I don't I, see how you can if you don't own it anymore. I think you can. If you're Eminem or 50 Cent, you have a lot of leverage, then you have a certain degree of ability to say to somebody, you're only going to do this or you can't do this. But that would Some only sort of last as control. long as their career. They, let me mm -hmm. get Alfred in trouble. 
will essence remain essence even now that it's no longer owned by blacks? The media has to be black owned is because black people have to make the decisions with regard to media. Now in the short run, essence is still essence. The question becomes what will essence look like 10 years from That's now, 20, right. 20 years from now. There's a difference between being black media, meaning you're targeting a black audience, and black owned media. We know that at the core of our magazine is a certain mission. But, but the question does, will that mission survive multiple Over generations? The, no, I think right. the, the mission is there. But when I mentioned the companies of 20, 30 years ago, you had not a Smokey Robinson sound, you had a Motown sound. Barry Gordy was not singing and dancing. And we right. have to get more African-American exactly. professionals um, and young people thinking, I need to learn the legal aspects. Mm -hmm. I need to learn and can rise up into the organization as an executive and an owner. And, and any one of us who is African-American who doesn't believe that that glass ceiling exists is fooling themselves. The glass ceiling is the boundaries that you create for yourself. There are very few people of African-American descent that have reached the highest goals within corporations. Life is full of challenges. We're going to always encounter some type of obstacle. I've seen young black males, young black females come out of the best graduate schools that there are and feel the world is open to them because that's what they were taught in school. I challenged myself in a different direction as opposed to waiting for someone to tell me that I was not going to ascend to this particular position. There's evidence to prove that black women do progress further than they used to be able to progress with the same credentials. It really depends on the environment. You can be a woman in the all boys club that knows how to maneuver through. Even that ceiling is pretty low. One of the good things about glass ceiling is that it makes us realize that as a people that we are entrepreneurs. Ownership is what it's all about. And that's the way to crack this glass ceiling. Do we still have the problem being imposed by the white corporate world? Or is it just something that we do to ourselves? We don't do it to ourselves. <laughs> Those barriers exist. But we could find hope in that 50 years ago, the, gra the glass ceiling was the janitor. You know, and we've been steadily raising that ceiling. And they're not, they're not in our minds. You're always in the situation of where the people above you are siding with their own. And that forces you into a position of thinking, hey, I'm blocked from advancing. I absolutely agree with everyone. There are opportunities, but they're limited opportunities. And that we can only go but so far. What has pushed the ceiling further? What, what is the cause? The same the thing that got us from slave to free. We're just going to push and push against the barrier. And one of us is going to get through. We don't know which one and we don't know when. I remember when I first came to Black Enterprise, I'm in my 18th year there, and the idea of an African-American Fortune 500 CEO was so foreign, just like a black quarterback was foreign back in those days. And now we look around and we can see a bunch of them. But that's been our whole history in this country. If we had to count on what was possible, we wouldn't go anywhere.